Uh, thank you and thanks for the warm welcome. Also um, a warm welcome from my side. It's also good morning for me. My name is Hans Fiemann. Uh, I am looking after the outbound product management act, uh, activities of the Oracle Spatial and Graph team. So I'm part of the um, Oracle Development Organization uh, and my focus is on both the spatial technologies as well as the graph technologies. I'm based out of Germany, out of uh, Hamburg to be precise. So as I said, it's good morning for me as well. And I would like to welcome you to a little talk on location intelligence, making sense of location uh, under the topic of tracking, visualizing, analyzing movement of people in a pandemic, which is kind of a hot topic for all of us at the moment, which is also the reason why we've gone virtual, right? I used to be traveling around user conferences a lot. It's now all gone, gone virtual, but it's a pleasure for me <clears throat> to have you all on this webcast. Uh, and in the spirit of the back to basics idea of the uh, Groundbreakers tour, I will be covering a couple of fundamentals of the spatial technologies, as well as what we have built specifically for contact tracing. So contact tracing is uh, the topic. Now, what I would like to do in order to start is I would like to ask you for a little bit of your imagination, right? In those days when we would still go to the office, maybe you still do, uh, we don't, and, and uh, the, the Oracle offices in, in Germany are all still closed, but imagine you go to the office, you arrive at your office, right? you, you enter uh, the, the building, uh, you swipe your badge and uh, you pass the turnstiles, you go up to uh, the lift and up to your office floor, swipe your badge again, enter through the glass door and sit down at your desk. But so far, you know, everything normal, you know, get started with your work. And then as usual, something happens. And in this case, the phone rings and your VP of human resources is on the phone, which is very uncommon. She would normally not call you. And she says, listen, I have just been notified that we had a, an employee who was tested positive. We need to find out which other employees has this person been in contact with for longer than 15 minutes in order to specifically notify those colleagues, make sure they quarantine and so on and so forth. And you, you have access to the batch swiping system which has a database underneath, you need to figure out which colleagues have been in contact with the infected person uh, and give me the list of all people over the last seven days who have been exposed to that person for longer than 15 minutes. And you go like, Ink. and you start working, right? You fire up your SQL developer and you look at the database which has all the swiping data probably looks something like this, right? You have the badge ID, which identifies uh, who has been uh, um, swiping their badge. You have the building, the floor, the room ID, which identifies, okay, which, which scanner was it? You have a notification whether it was uh, in or out, whether this person entered the room or exited the room, and you have a timestamp. And now you need to get started with a little bit of SQL magic to extract all those, um, all those user IDs which have been interacting with the given user ID for longer than 15 minutes. So you don't need, you can't do a simple join because uh, you know you have these overlapping time spans. If you look at the table uh, closely here, you'll see that. Uh, the user 1473 and the user 8671 have been in one of the same room for just under 15 minutes because the one entered here and then uh, the other one exited here. Um, so that's the, the exercise you think, oh my, wouldn't it be a lot easier if Oracle had a function to do this on the basis of this table and Oracle has you covered. This is actually what we've built. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually something which is, you know, which evolved out of, existing projects, right? We, for example, we have a, a fair amount of interest at the moment from, from universities who are uh, using scanner data to 
um, keep track of which students have been um, uh, have been attending which seminar or have been in in which auditorium at what time to find out if one person was infected uh, who was in the same room at the time to notif to notify people. So we've built this contact tracing API, which is essentially a function that upon indication of which user you want to track, what start time, what end time, you then give it the table, the existing table, which has all the swiping data, you need to identify, okay, in that table, what's the, the column which has the user ID, what's the column which has the building ID, the floor ID, the room ID, the in, uh, whether it was in or out, and the timestamp. Uh, and there's a couple more uh, options which we've added. And that you can use straight away. What the API call returns is a table of results. So we, we hand back um, an object, uh, essentially, uh, a table of results in which every row represents one contact period, or as we say, one, one segment. So that, as I said, the table of re results, you need the table constructor to, to make sense of the data. Bottom line is, all you need is a SQL statement, which looks like this. You have right, the from table clause here. You have the API call, get all swipe IO durations. You say, okay, this is the, the infected user. This is the, the start time uh, when I want to start uh, tracking. Uh, this is the end time. My table is called swiping underscore table. You have a user ID column, building ID, and so forth. Um, and I select um, all for all segments to aggregate, but I'll explain that in more detail in a moment. And that was it. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, now, couple of comments on this. Um, th this is, I mean, it's not magic. It's not rocket science, right? It's, it's an API uh, which we've built where we've essentially bundled our you know, regular database technology together with a couple of best practices into this pre-built function, making sure we you know, make use of all the parallelism and uh, physical clustering on disk. If you have partitioning, uh, use, use partitioning for, for that purpose. The nice thing for you is it's there. It's free of charge free of charge with every edition of the database. It's also, of course, included in, in all the relevant cloud services. Now, uh, b before, you, before you actually spin up uh, your 18C or 19C instance, um, you need a patch still. It's, it's, um, it will be included by default in uh, the next database release. Uh, but in 18C or 19C, you can also use it, except you need a patch to uh, uh, which which needs to be installed, and uh, you need uh, SysDBA privileges uh, for that purpose. So you can't just uh, use your uh, autonomous database for that purpose, but we'll need to install that. Um, so when you have the patch, you're up and running, uh, and that should be it. Um, of course, just to re-emphasize that um, we do not provide the solution for the swiping system. Right? Neither do we have scanners nor do we sell badges, uh, nor uh, do we have a you know, complete solution uh, for this. We expect a table to be there, which will normally be the case. If you have such a system installed, we expect a table to be there and you can make use of that. And now I could actually end today's talk. Is this really all? I mean, did you sign up for this webinar just to, to hear that, oh, now Oracle has a higher, uh, higher order or higher level function that, that does contact tracing on the, on the basis of, of badge swiping? That was probably not what you expected. And yes, of course, you're right. Uh, we don't only have this API. We do have a second one, and that's a little more sophisticated. Um, that's an API which actually does take into account um, location, so proximity, and time. So uh, I guess when you registered for uh, uh, today's call, you were probably expecting to look at situations like this, right? You have GPS tracks or tracks from some, some other tracking system, which you can visualize on a map and which you can analyze maybe even interactively where you, know, you would figure out, okay, which user has been close enough for long enough um, to which other user in order to figure out if something could have happened at that point. And that 
is going to be the main part of uh, today's presentation. Right? The fundamental concepts I was talking about in the swiping uh, API, uh, the batch swiping uh, implementation, are actually quite similar, um, uh, except here you have a, a somewhat more um, sophisticated approach where, as I said, you want to identify people who have been close enough for long enough. Just to let you know, this is a topic which is, of course, particularly relevant in the context of a pandemic, but uh, even before the, the, uh, the whole pandemic started in, in, in January of this year, I was talking to um, one of the nationwide police forces here in, in, in Europe, and that, they had the very same requirement. Uh, they wanted to track uh, criminals and suspects and wanted to figure out, okay, which person has been close enough for long enough so that an interaction between two people could have occurred, maybe, you know, uh, a conversation uh, or, or something which could not be monitored through the mobile phone network. Or you want to do monitoring of ships at sea where you have two, two vessels close to each other uh, such that maybe they could hand over things, maybe illegal things. Uh, or you could use it in tracking light, wildlife or you could even be very creative and take into account um, location for uh, social matching if you are in the process of developing a dating platform maybe. Right? The idea is always the same, um, uh, and as in the case of the swiping, uh, the batch swiping API, we also expect an infrastructure which just delivers the locations in some way, shape, or form, uh, and it ends up in a table which uh, you can access. And in its simple form, it looks kind of uh, like, like this, right? We would have a, a table which has a user ID column, timestamp and a location. The location would come from maybe a GPS device, the mobile phone network. If you have an indoor tracking system, you could use that. In any case, it would, um, uh, it would land your data in that table ready for you uh, to use. But oh, oh, you can already see the, the, the data type here. That column is of type SDO underscore geometry. I don't know if you've been looking at the spatial technologies in the past, uh, but uh, just so that everybody ends up on the same page, let me do a quick recap of the spatial features. Uh, first comment I would like to make here is, uh, for those of you who haven't noticed, um, in December of last year, we have made all uh, spatial features available free of charge with all editions of uh, the database as part of our uh, converged database strategy. Same applies to um, the uh, analytics, uh, so the advanced analytics option um, at spatial and the graph features are now available free of charge with all editions of the database. For the spatial part, that means you have a data type which you use to store various types of uh, spatial data. Various types can be uh, point data, lines, line strings, areas, that could also be three-dimensional objects, it can be uh, road networks, it can be geo-referenced raster images like satellite images and, and so forth. So we have data types to store these kinds of data. We have a spatial index type, which I'll explain in just a moment. And then of course, um, uh, if you have all the data in the database, you wanna do spatial specific things such as find me all billboards which are in the projected path of a hurricane, uh, like on the right-hand side here, right? This is a screenshot from uh, Outfront Media uh, who are operating large billboards in, in the US. And obviously, in, in particularly in the Southern states, they are at risk uh, from hurricanes. And for them, looking at the projected path of a hurricane is always crucial um, because data they get from NOAA and then they put it onto a map and look at, okay, which of my structures are particularly at risk? Where do I need to send my field teams quickly? For that purpose, what they need to do is what we call um, topological queries. They need to figure out which points are inside of the given project, uh, um, projected uh, disaster area. And they also need some functions 
like find me a buffer area around uh, a, a given point uh, of, of a certain size and so on. This is the typical functionality you would need in a spatial database, independent of whether it's Oracle or not. Um, and this is, of course, what we also provide. Above and beyond the core functionalities in the database, we have a number of services for map visualization, for turning uh, addresses into coordinates, for route calculations, or also for uh, publishing data using uh, the appropriate standards in, in that space. Uh, and all of that is available um, on all editions of the database to start with. Um, but of course, that also means it's available in all editions of the uh, respective cloud services, including um, the Exadata cloud service or clouded customer. Um, it is also available on the autonomous database. There are some small uh, limitations, but for you know, the typical analytical use cases, uh, you can pretty much use everything. The limitations are more around uh, uh, georeferenced raster imagery, but you know, I assume for the time being that you're not operating with huge amounts of satellite images and the like, right? So that, the overall platform, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain in, in just a moment. So that, um, in the database, you have the following functionality. First of all, we have this object type SDO geometry, which we use to store all kinds of geometries, right? Be it point data, be it lines, line strings, and so forth. And as we're talking georeferenced uh, uh, data, we also need to include what is known as the spatial reference ID, which reflects the coordinate system. Now, for GPS data, that's simple. It's the same uh, all over the place. It's a system called WGS84. So no need to think about uh, that if you just use that type of data. But there may be other situations where you, you need this. And then uh, in this object type, you can either store an individual point or you have an array of coordinates which, um, which uh, encodes the geometry which you have. And in uh, practical terms, this is what you can do. If you want to insert um, or if you want to create, if you want to inst instantiate a point, um, this is what you could do. You do select SDO geometry and then uh, use the, uh, this text notation uh, to generate a point, give it a coordinate system. Uh, and here you are, you have a two dimensional point uh, at these uh, coordinates, latitude, longitude, and then um, that is how you would create such a, uh, such a geometric object. Or you could explain explicitly uh, create it like that, it's the same. Right. On the basis of these points, you can already do these uh, types of calculations I was already referring to earlier. Now, if you have more complex geometric objects, you need to stick them into this long array of coordinates. Like, you know, uh, if you want to describe the boundary of Germany as a country, right, you would need a geometry that has all the points which make up the boundary of Germany. And we have a uh, a function, an API, which allows you to extract those vertices um, as objects. And again, you need to use the, the table function uh, to actually um, uh, plot it uh, or, uh, or extract it as, as a table. Now I'm seeing that there is a chat question. Let me just quickly check if that's something which is a question and no, it is not. So fair enough, I'll just keep on going. Um, Right, so this is how you would operate with uh, spatial objects in, uh, in general and or how you would store them. And if you then want to use them, um, let me just quickly show you how that works so that you have a bit of a feeling for how spatial queries would work. And I'll combine that with a little bit of a geography lesson here, right? On the right hand side, what you can see here is um, Germany. Uh, Germany consists of 16 states, which we call Länder. Right, the, the yellow one here is the state which is called North Rhine-Westphalia, which you uh, may have come across. Uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia, we have cities such as Dusseldorf, um, Cologne, Bonn, Dortmund. If you're, if you're more into soccer, right, you may know Dortmund. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. If you now have um, the question of which of the German lender are touching this given state, how would you encode this in SQL? Well, for that purpose, we have what is known as the 
relate operator, sdo underscore relate. And all you would need to do is, if you have a table of, of all the states of all the lender, um, then uh, you would uh, select North Rhine rest failure uh, as uh, your query window, which goes into the second uh, parameter. And here you have uh, the column, which has all your boundary data. You give it the mask of touch, because you're just looking for objects which are, are touching North Rhine rest failure. And if that uh, predicate is true, then you know, return the geometric objects which satisfy this condition. You can imagine this is a computationally expensive um, uh, process, right? Because you need to go along the entire boundary of North Rhine Westphalia and check, particularly if it's you know if you're checking uh, whether these objects objects touch, um, you want to make uh, you, you need to make sure that there is no overlap, for example, or that there is maybe a gap between uh, the, the the two states, uh, which for whatever reason is in the data and is too wide. So computationally expensive, you don't want to match the state of North Rhine-Westphalia against all states in Germany, let alone all states or, or all uh, first level administrative boundaries across Europe or even worldwide, right? To make this more efficient, you need a spatial index. And the way this works is um, we create a, what we call a minimum bounding rectangle around every object. So you essentially have a rectangle around North Rhine Westphalia here. You have a rectangle around uh, Lower Saxony, which is the state up here. You have uh, Hesse uh, with, with its minimum bounding rectangle and so on. And the query is actually split into two steps. The first step just checks if the minimum bounding rectangles interact. If there is an overlap between uh, the minimum bounding rectangles covering the candidate states, that, that gives you a set of candidates for your query, which in this case is just the neighboring states already. There might be you know, an overlap uh, and, and so on, but it gives you candidates which are kind of in the right area. You don't need to check whether Berlin has any spatial relationship with North, North Rhine-Westphalia because the minimum bounding rectangles do not interact. And on the basis of the, the, the candidate geometries, then you need to do the detailed test uh, and check if, they're actually, if they actually do satisfy the mass equal to touch relationship. And that would be your uh, that would be your final answer to the query, right? So this is how we would do spatial queries. This is uh, how the minimum bank bounding rectangles are organized in uh, the index, right? You aggregate them to higher level uh, bounding rectangles, aggregate them uh, to higher bounding rectangles, uh, and so on up to the root. And on the basis of this uh, R tree index, we do the first filter step, right? So that's that is the introduction to uh, the spatial technologies. If you found this terribly confusing, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you uh, uh, don't want to know about all of this, fair enough. Um, my suggestion in that case would be to use Spatial Studio. Spatial Studio is a, a tool which we've made available last year uh, for anyone who does not know anything about uh, location data or spatial uh, objects and, and so forth, and still do two things. One, um, you can use it for analytics, for you know, interactive maps, uh, generating interactive maps and so on. But you can also use it for uh, development purposes uh, to uh, make your life a little, a little easier. And the nice thing about the tool is it, it hides all the complexity of uh, the things which I have just explained in more detail so that you understand what's going on under the covers, right? So you don't need to deal with coordinate systems. You don't need to deal with how do I get data into my database, right? You, you just take a typical um, file which you would have in, in this format, it could be a GeoJSON file, could be um, a shape file. The tool is designed such that you can, you know, just dump the data into the database prepare it, meaning you would create a spatial index on it, or if it is address data, it would even allow you to use our Maps Cloud service 
uh, to convert the address into coordinates such that for an address you can you know, create a pin on a map and then you can create your analytic workflows and render things uh, on, on a map or if you're using the Oracle Analytics Cloud you can use the tool to also hand off uh, uh, the results to uh, OAC right in particular on the developer side uh, um, it makes your life easier for instance if you have point data as latitude and longitude um, the tool recognizes that or you can actually point the tool at the columns and say okay this is longitude this is latitude turn this into a uh, spatial object in a function based index such that I can do spatial queries on top of that uh, latitude longitude data for example or you could use um, uh, um, topological operators and spatial queries um, by means of just clicking on tiles without really knowing what they do under the covers uh, there, there is a you know, wizard based interface that helps you to create these queries or even workflows of queries and uh, that should make it a lot more simple and self-service to, to deal with this kind of information right, so that the overall platform actually looks like this right we I've talked about the spatial features <clears throat> in the database I've talked about or mentioned at least the the services we provide which are sitting on top of these core capabilities which we make available as JE components which are not living in the database but run in a Java runtime environment outside the database for example to render cartographic maps which we make use of in the Oracle Maps Cloud service <clears throat> which in turn is being used by the IoT Cloud or OAC or uh, other applications and so on and of course we have all the developer APIs if you want to create interactive uh, maps you can do so um, using JavaScript and the Oracle Maps API uh, and so on or if you're more into Python you have the CX Oracle integration or the uh, Node Oracle DB all of those know what geospatial objects uh, are about such that you can make use of them in uh, tools and frameworks be it in Apex uh, be it in ORDS or SQL developer actually helps you, you know, deal with this kind of information also right so with that now how can I use this for contact tracing so bringing us back to the original question of what we really wanted to do here is how can I use that this for for contact tra tracing now imagine we have two people say Jane and Bob and they go jogging right now, the question is where did Jane meet Bob so you need to find all the matching uh, locations and if you've ever been you know, working with GPS data you'll notice this kind of information is inaccurate so uh, no matter what you do the GPS points will never be or hardly ever be in the very same location so you need a bit of a tolerance here and coming back to the topic of contact tracing um, you if you want to meet, match the, the timestamps again these things will be inaccurate uh, or the, the timestamps will you know, just not be sent out they will not be synchronized so things will not be um, happening at the same point in time so that also there you need a tolerance in um, in time and then the question is for how long do they actually uh, um, walk together right if we look at that a little more closely right the, the first question is find me all points along the path which are let's say less than uh, two meters apart then looking at all the tracks you would say okay these points are relatively close those are relatively close those are relatively close okay so they give me a match now it may be that Jane and Bob this morning didn't start at the same time and they are five minutes apart in which case the tracks are almost identical but the times are off so that it is not a match right so you really want to make sure that the points are within distance and within the given uh, time tolerance so uh, with the given path Bob would be a candidate for a match um, but you would still need to look at the time tolerance and here if we have the starting time at, at 1 p.m. and within let's say 28 seconds we have a, a time stamp uh, on a location which is still relatively close this gives us a match which is in space and in time 
within the specified window so that this would actually be a match, that would be a match, this would be a match, and so on. And then if they, they split, uh, then that would end the joint segment. Right, so this is uh, the, the, the difficult question here. We have an inaccuracy in space and we have an inaccuracy in time. And then there's one more level of complexity. <clears throat> if you want to figure out, okay, uh, how long have Jane and Bob be in contact? You have to do two things. You have to look at uh, the matching segments, uh, the matching path segments, but it is also possible that there were you know, small deviations for maybe just a short period of time and they are still together. It may also be that they split like here, you know, you have one path, they, they separate at two minutes past one. Jane is uh, sort of on her own and in the evening, she, they are, Bob and Jane uh, meet again, right? And then there's the rest of the track. So this, this gives us one segment where they match that gives us one segment where they match. If there is just a short intermediate period, uh, that may be counted as one encounter. If it is not, if it's longer, then it may be you know, two different segments. So we need to be able to, um, to specify a tolerance, a chaining tolerance as we say, which uh, defines from which time onwards two separate segments would be uh, identified as such. Right, so with all of that, we now have the possibility to use an API kind of similar to the swiping, uh, the batch swiping API, which I was referring to in the very beginning. Um, we have implemented a function in the database ready for you to use, which on the basis of the user you want to track and the start and time uh, specification uh, of the tracking period, together with the distance tolerance, the time tolerance, the chaining tolerance, which I was just referring to, on the basis of uh, the table which you need to specify, gives you all the encounters, right? So you have the, the um, tolerances in distance, in time, and in chaining, which I was, I was just talking about. And that API, again, just in the case, just like in the case of the batch swiping API, gives you, uh, with this call of get all durations, gives you a table of results in which each row reflects one segment where the two individuals or the two objects, I mean, this could be vehicles or vessels or whatever, um, have met. So that, again, you use the table constructor to, to fetch the results. What you would get is, uh, what you get back is with the API call is the user you're tracking, all users he or she has been in touch with, the geometry of the path, either an aggregation of all segments into one or the individual segments, each with start time, end time, and duration. And if they are aggregated, if, if the individual segments are aggregated into, into one, uh, then I also uh, return the number of uh, contacts such that um, oh, here we go, um, such that uh, you know, we make a distinction between either returning each and every individual segment which was matched or which in, in this case was like two minutes, 40 seconds here, one minute, 48 seconds there, uh, with the chaining tolerance of uh, 60 seconds uh, in between. This would clearly be two individual segments which we would count individually but we would only return them individually if we use the flag segment such that we return the individual uh, matches in the appropriate uh, function call. If we say all, then we get the sum of all matches. And I hope I haven't confused you, but uh, you know, I'd give you a concrete example here. If I, if I take um, the API call, right, I enter uh, my, my, the user I want to track, which would be, let's say, user ID of seven, start time, end time, distance parameters uh, in meters or seconds, all the table parameters, if I say segment or all is all, that will return the user I'm tracking, the user he or she's been interacting with, the duration, uh, start time, end time, and the number of 
uh, context. That, that's sort of the output here, right? I'm looking for all encounters involving user seven, and apparently user seven has met uh, user five, user seven has met user six, user eight. Uh, and here you can actually see user six has had a, a long interaction in the given uh, um, interval um, between start time and end time, but it was, this was not only one contact time, but it was nine, nine uh, contact, uh, nine, nine individual segments, nine individual encounters. And if I use the flag of segment rather than all, I get all of these nine uh, segments individually, each with start time, end time, duration, uh, and of course the, the, the user ID, right? So that's uh, the, the API call. Um, there's a, a couple of things which we have added as an option. Uh, so if I look at the um, uh, location uh, data table uh, with the optional columns. We've also added the possibility to use the accuracy. Like if you use GPS data, you have a given accuracy. If you use indoor uh, positioning, you know, you may have a higher accuracy. Uh, and uh, uh, there's one more uh, optimization which is possible, which we've uh, noticed that in the testing system uh, for which we've built the API originally, does make a difference, which is if I do date arithmetic, depending on, on what platform you have, what environment you use, uh, um, you may have a slight overhead compared to using arithmetic on number. So if you really, really have large amounts of data, and in the case which, <clears throat> which we were working on, that was a nationwide system in the Middle East, that was a serious amount of data. So we you know, try to build in every optimization we could. And one optimization was to actually convert date into numbers. You could use, you could use uh, Unix Epoch, for example, or you use just the, the regular um, uh, date um, function in, in the Oracle database to normalize your, uh, your date. And then you would only do um, number arithmetic rather than, than date arithmetic. And that gives you a little more performance such that overall um, we have built in a couple of optimizations. Uh, there are a few fundamental things which you need to do, right? If, if you want to have proper performance, first of all, you need a spatial index uh, on uh, the geometry table. That's, that's clear. The create index statement looks like that. Then uh, you need an index on the, the user ID column and uh, the um, timestamp column. Then if you have serious amounts of data, you also want to uh, look into partitioning and you want to partition by time. That actually helps you in two ways, just to, to make that point here. If you use partitioning um, in, in this context and you want to extract just a given time period, which you need to specify in your API call, that of course enables you to exclude a potentially large number of partitions up front. So partition pruning helps you to make the, the, the data set a lot more manageable. Plus, for the remaining partitions, we do all the operations in parallel. So that also uh, helps you. Right? So partitioning is, uh, is a big factor if you have large amounts of data. The other thing, and I don't know if you've been looking into this, but we've been promoting this in the context of large volumes of location data already for a long time. Um, the other thing you will want to consider is physical clustering of your data on disk, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever looked at the create table um, uh, DDL statement in, in that detail, but in the data warehousing guide, you will find examples of how to use the clustering clause uh, to physically store um, data which is close together uh, in the vicinity, in, in, in ideally in one of the same block such that if you have a, let's say you have a GPS track, uh, the GPS track consists of a thousand points, right? You don't want these 1,000 points to be scattered across hundreds or, or even a thousand um, data blocks in, in the Oracle database. You want them to be stored physically together. Same thing with uh, timestamps. You don't want them all over the place. You want them physically uh, together. 
And the clustering um, uh, option allows you to do exactly that. Uh, such that you minimize the number of blocks you hit if you, um, if you run your, your spatial query. Right, so that's, that's one uh, optimization and date as number I was already uh, mentioning. As I said, you could use uh, Unix Epoch, or in, in this case, we, we just created uh, date as number by converting um, the, the timestamp into, into a number. Right, so with all of that, we've been talking about the swiping API, we've been talking about the uh, proximity and, uh, and time-based, uh, location-based uh, API for contact tracing. Uh, I've gone over the fundamentals of uh, spatial data in the large. What can you do with the result? Just to give you a quick heads up on that, of course, you can put things onto a map. Again, my recommendation would be to start with Spatial Studio to, to have a, a look at things. It's a tool which you get for free with the database, so why not use that? Uh, that allows you to extract the appropriate uh, data sets which you, which you want to look at. It uh, helps you to highlight uh, specific matches and so forth. But there's also one more thing which I briefly wanted to touch on today, which will also uh, be a topic in this afternoon's um, uh, Groundbreakers sessions. Johnny Cheresa will be talking about um, uh, graph analytics. And graph analytics here, you can use very nicely for further investigation in that if you represent every person which you're looking at in your contact tracing API as a vertex in a graph, and every encounter as an edge, right? You, so you have one person here who has met this person there, so there's a link here, and he has met that person there, there's a link, and this person here, and that person in turn has, has met this person, and so on. So if you represent all encounters as a network consisting of vertices and edges, as we would have in a graph, then you can use all the graph features in the Oracle database, to, for example, find indirect connections. You can use it to find super spreaders. Those people you know, have been interacting with many others or who have infected many others. You can use it to determine clusters, right? Graph algorithms are designed such that they can automatically identify those parts of the graph which is more closely interconnected uh, than uh, the rest. Or uh, another interesting aspect which I'll briefly show you is you could uh, find those individuals which are the link between different uh, communities, right? And with all these features of the Oracle database, uh, which were originally part of the graph, part of the spatial and graph option, which allow you to do kind of pattern matching, graph analytics, visualization, and so forth, you can do analysis like this, right? You can look at which users have had many interactions. Uh, in, in graph terms, this would be known as, you would look at degree centrality, or you can look at those users or those uh, people who have been interacting with people who in turn have been interacting with many people, right? One algorithm which is nice to use in that context is the so-called PageRank um, algorithm. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll not go into the details, but I'm sure Johnny will cover this in the 4 p.m. session uh, today. Or final thing I wanted to touch on, uh, a graph algorithm which is called between this centrality which if you let it run across the entire graph of encounters, will highlight those vertices which are sitting between communities. So if you think about the question which will eventually come up, hopefully at some stage, stage here in the current pandemic, which is where do I start with the vaccine once I have it? Who are important people which need to be vaccinated first well, one thing to look at could potentially be users who are sitting between communities. If you have a person who's interacting with this group of people and with that group of people, this link, if I cut that link by, by making this person, by vaccinating this person, then I can avoid any transmission from that cluster to this cluster. So uh, this may be an interesting aspect where you know, even graph analytics can play a role, I hope. Uh, in the short time I had, I've given you a little bit of food for thought. If you found this useful, here's a couple of links uh, with further details. We have actually had a full Oracle, uh, Ask Tom Office Hour session on contact tracing. 
which you can find on the link here. If you want to try out spatial queries, uh, feel free to use the live SQL um, platform for that very purpose. That'll get you up and running quickly. If you found this session useful, feel free to tweet about it. My Twitter handle is Spatial Hannes. We have a few more people you may want to follow if you're into Twitter. Uh, and then just one quick final remark. If you found the uh, graph analytics piece interesting, first thing I said this afternoon, there will be a 4 p.m. session on uh, uh, graph analytics. There will also be a, a 5 p.m. session by uh, Jim Chaprinsky uh, on machine learning, Apex, and spatial, if you found the spatial aspect interesting. For graphs, um, the Oracle Analytics and Data Oracle user community, which is not the EOUC, which is running this event, but the um, part of the independent Oracle user group, the IOUG, uh, that is specifically focusing on analytics and um, spatial technologies, graph technologies. We are running a three-day TechCast event next week, and October 14th is Graph Day. So we'll talk about graph databases and graph analytics starting at 4 p.m. Central European with an introduction to the different graph technologies we have. And then I'm really looking forward to having a presentation by um, one of our Spanish financial services customers, Caixa Bank, on how they are using uh, social networks uh, to identify clusters using uh, graph technologies and what they do with this. We also had AT&T on the agenda. Uh, it looks as if this would not happen, so we'll most likely have a session on machine learning and graphs uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday, and there will be another session on RDF graphs uh, as well as part of that. And with that, I would like to come to an end and thank you for your time and your attention. I noticed there was one uh, question um, on which version of Oracle is using uh, Spatial Studio. Um, Spatial Studio can operate um, uh, on various versions. We have made it available uh, on database as part of database 19 but it can use older versions uh, as well so you are not constrained uh, in that respect um, in fact you can use it with all kinds of data you can use it with uh, geojson data raw geojson data to render things and so forth all it needs is one database connection for its metadata repository uh, so you can use it nicely with for example the uh, autonomous database free tier and again we have a full ask Tom session on how to set up spatial studio on uh, uh, ATP free tier if you uh, want to uh, want to take a look at that it comes as uh, um, uh, an optional download I don't have the link at hand but if you search for spatial studio and that is S-P-A-T-I-A-L, right? It's not Special Studio, but it's Spatial Studio. Um, uh, if, you, if you Google that, uh, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it the, the download page and so on. So you can uh, grab the, the, the latest version and that, could, uh, that should get you going, even if you're not on a 19C database. Good. Are there more questions if you have any questions feel free to put them into the q a um, uh, into the q a uh, box looks like they are none but of course we can wait for one minute <laughs> if someone decides to ask something thank you so much uh, hans it's uh, it's a very interesting topic and if uh, someone uh, need this type of technology in their project, it's worth to, to dig it uh, further. It's very interesting, uh, not only uh, because of tracking um, person during this time, but yeah, tracking uh, wild uh, animals or not necessarily wild animals. I, I, I know that um, there are uh, people that are putting chips in their um, ears, animals, uh, <laughs> uh, and the, those animals, it's good to be tracked on which 
field they are eating the grass and so on. So it's very interesting. It would be interesting to see also the, um, um, the let's say the uh, end side of solution to have um, an application which is uh, already uh, which has already implemented this technique hopefully in the next uh, tour or next webinars uh, sometimes in the future we will schedule something like that yeah well actually um, this the, even this afternoon right as i said jim chaprinsky yes, will yes. talk about uh, location data uh, and machine learning and Apex. Yep. Uh, so uh, he will look at how to convert addresses to uh, into coordinates, for example. Um, and you know, location data is all over the place, right? Yep. There's, there's, there's no database without location data. Sometimes it's hidden, like in the case of the contact uh, uh, tracing with the swiping data, right? You have a building ID of, of a floor number and, and, and a room ID maybe, that is a, an indirect location, or you have a place name like uh, whatever, uh, 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 you know, an, an airport or the Eiffel Tower or something, which also refers to a location which you can make use of. And uh, there are loads of applications these days which use maps uh, and uh, representation of either points on a map or uh, coloring of the map according to be it revenue, be it social indicators of some sort, whatever. Right, so there's a lot of applications in that domain. Yes, that's true. Thank you so much again.